All right, we're going to go live uh, again. Uh, got something happening down here, uh, a meeting. Clive and Bundy is on the scene. And uh, we'll see what's going to happen. Come on in the shade. Mr. Bundy. This shade is, that's what it's made for. Could I get your autograph on that? You want it on the outside? Or? Yeah, anywhere on that cover. Yeah. You can run under aim and it'll work. Thank you very much, sir. Well, welcome. So, as promised, we we said we'd have a press conference at one, and now it's what one forty-five. So <laughs> we're doing all right. Um, I really don't have a lot to say, so I'm sure you want to ask. I'd add uh, some questions. Um, all the only thing I could say is this: is uh, I've seen probably dad. I've probably seen nine to ten rigs, clear full of four wheelers that have head out there, and they came. A bunch of them came across the Mason down. We've seen horses and sheep have been playing in this river. And uh, ten days ago, if you did that, they would have pounced on you, shoved your face in the dirt, and taken you into 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 their federal jail. And uh, so, if anything has been done that's good, at least that's been good. The people feel free to use this country and and feel free to do that. And so, I'd like to say thanks to my dad for standing up as well. I also want to recognize that freedom is not being afraid to choose. That's what freedom is: not being a not being afraid to choose. And uh, that's what we've been able to do out here: is not be afraid to go out and use this land and and. Uh, that was because the people stood up. So. All right, Dad. <laughs> All you. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, every day we think, well, is anybody going to be at the press conference? And uh, I really meant to be here at 1 o'clock, but we sort of I got home and uh, went to a baby blessing down in Moapa today. And we got home, and uh, I don't know, there just seemed to be a few security problems, and when I needed to come, I couldn't come, and, uh, but uh, really nothing serious that I know of. <coughs> uh, you know, I look for direction every morning, and uh, the last couple of mornings, the only direction I could see together is we got a job that's not done. Uh, you know, and of course, what part of the mandate was is for the, the county sheriffs of each county to disarm the bureaucracies within that army. In other words, take away the guns. And as I thought about it this morning, it just seemed to be a little more serious. Either we're going to take away those guns uh, in that manner, where we're doing it county by county, or we're going to have to fight a civil war. And I don't know, I hate to say that, but that's that's really what I could see happening. That's where that's where we're headed. And now I think the good Lord's give us a, a way to solve this problem uh, if we want to listen to him. If we don't want to listen to him, then I guess we'll progress on down the road until this country will be taken over like this county was here a week ago. Uh, <coughs> a week ago, I, I, I guess I'm right on time. A week, it seemed like it been a year ago, but a week ago, Today, 
And about this time was about the time that uh, we said, go get the job done, get her done. And you know, we had horses up on this hill and they just, how many was there to witness that? Okay, you know, you guys can tell the story better than I can, but you know, there's horses up on the hill, 50, 60 of them, and they were, I don't know, several hundred of, of people here around and when we said go get the job done they took off and went out and hogged the freeway off and went and up where those cattle were and they faced this army it was an army of all the people against the people that you know that really sounds terrible you we the army of the people against the people and we've had this army against us for years in, in the sense of a bureaucracy, uh, bureaucrats depressing us and causing us trouble where we're not able to produce, where we're not able to educate, where we're not even able to feed ourselves without a bureaucracy. And uh, and we're, we've got the determination to where we're not producing. We're not, our industries are all over in China and places like that because of regulations. You know, the EPA and all of these different things. That's why these industries move. And then the livestock industry, uh, they're, they're, elim they're eliminating this. I know in Nevada since 1980, which most of us think that's not very far back, there's only half the amount of cattle in Nevada as, as it were in 1980. And if you go back to 1964, that's the year I graduated, that's 50 years, uh, Elko County was the cattle capital of the world. There's more cattle in that area in that square miles than anywhere in the world. And look at it, we are not, how we are now. We're not producing enough beef. We're wondering whether we got enough other agriculture products. And the rest of the world, <coughs> for example, China, that's what we've seen come forth the last 10, 15 years. China is now wealthy enough to buy beef and eat beef. And so now they compete with America. You know, 15 years ago, they've eaten uh, fish and uh, rice. Today, they're eating uh, America beef, but it's not only America is not producing the beef. Australia and Argentina, and those countries that used to import a metric, millions of metric ton of beef to America, they've got a better market. So in other words, we have a bigger responsibility as producers to feed not only the world, but to feed we the people. And we can't do it under this, uh, this these bureaucracies. Uh, they're just, they're eating us up. They're not only eating our money up and eating our, the fat of the land, they're depressing the producer to where he can't produce. And that's very sad. And what do we need? We need freedom. We need freedom to be able to exercise our conscience, we need freedom to be able to experiment and to uh, uh, move around and, and uh, use our resources. America is still the greatest land on earth with more resources. You know, you're starting to hear rumors that we have enough oil now. For years we thought we were going to run out of oil. Now we got enough oil. I know we have a lot of coal. We have uranium. We have a lot of resources. We got we got a lot of water. We, there's no reasons we should be in a depression. We're every one of us is sort of anxious to get out and work. Our young people don't even know how to work because they haven't had the opportunity. There's nobody needing to be on welfare in this land. We've got a job for everybody. And what about all of those babies that are not coming to this earth? How come we, the people, allow that to happen? There's a plenty of room and plenty of space for those, those little spirits to come here and receive their bodies and mingle with us and let us love them. Let them have part of this American experience. <coughs> Instead of that, we cut their life off and don't even let them, let them be born. <laughs> Things like that, we got to take care of that. I think the 
the start really is that's 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 take the arms away from these people. <coughs> I need some water. <coughs> I think that our responsibility is is so sacred, sacred and so patriotic. I think it's the same same responsibilities our forefathers, our founding fathers had. <coughs> they said that, and I don't know who quoted this, but he said that when they come out of the committees and uh, evidently made a vote and decide what they're going to do, which one said that they asked the media or people asking, what have we got? And he says you've got a republic form of government if you can yes, keep it. Keep. Ben Franklin. Okay, Ben said that. Okay, and and here we are down the road a couple hundred years, and it's still we have a republic form of government if we can keep it. If we don't keep that re republican form of government, what have we got? Dictatorship, Dictatorship communism, and, uh, and there's a I don't see him here today. But let me tell you a little story. You guys that was on the front line of the bridge seen that this happened. There was a, a man there, and uh, I've known him for several years. He's been around here. He actually worked from a neighbor. And he had a flag. I don't know what flag he had. But he wanted to charge the enemy, sh charge those BLM guns. And he wanted to climb over the fence, and, and he was willing to take the first bullet. And you know what he said? He says, I've lived in a communist country. And I'll be damned if I'm going to live that way again. <laughs> and he was ready to take the first bullet for we the people. He, he's been raised in Russia and worked for Russia government. Anyway, uh, we got the work to do, and and what a what an opportunity, what a. What a party we had last night, and just like Evan, what a freedom we've got today. There's one thing that was on my mind, though, through this whole thing, and especially last night. Uh, <clears throat> you look around, and we're all basically just white people. Where is our colored brother? Where is our Mexican brother? Where is our Chinese? Where, where are they? They're they're just as much American as we are, and we we're not they're not with us. If they're not with us, they're going to be against us. I I want to. Uh, I've I've been raised here in this little community. I hardly ever seen a, a black man until I was almost a teenager. <laughs> but let me tell you experience. I lived in California during the Watts riot. And I worked, got a, a heavy piece of equipment, and I was working on the east side of uh, Los Angeles, building a Ford garage when the riot started. And I worked with a black man, was, he was an owner truck driver. Uh, he owned his own truck, and I worked on that job the day this, and that man was sick and humble. He said he sort of knew what was gonna happen. And I, of course, the rest of us didn't understand. And then pretty soon, there was uh, the cops come by and stop, uh, as I made my pass to dump the dirt out there in the parking lot, a cop come by and he stopped me and he said, have you ever seen anybody uh, in that uh, uh, phone booth who was on a construction job? <coughs> I said, no, I haven't. He said, there's just a murder reported in that phone booth. And around the, around the valley, of Los Angeles Valley, there's a fire here and a fire here and a fire here. And now there was a, a murder reported in that phone booth. <coughs> Before the day was over, I couldn't leave the job site except just enough to get it to a hotel. And I got up in about the 14th, 15th story of this hotel and watched the TV. And when I watched that TV, I looked out the window and I could see the very same sight. The TV camera was in that building taking pictures, and I was looking out the window. And guess what I see? About a block south, two blocks south of Harbor Freeway, 
they were setting the world on fire. And who was setting it on fire? It wasn't we the people, it was the Negro group. People herself were setting their own city on fire and raping their own city and, and stealing from their own city. And then I watched that for three days. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even have a car, and I finally got somebody to bring my car up around the city. And of course, I didn't have no money by now, and I didn't have no gas. And I lived down the Harbor Freeway towards uh, Long Beach. And so we decided to go down the freeway. And we headed down the freeway. There was no cars, not even one car. The only thing that looked like the National Guard was across the top of the overpass. It was the only thing of a, a friendly thing I could see. And you're, you're in your equipment. Right? I'm, no, I, I couldn't bring the equipment. I'm in my car now. And I'm going down this freeway about eight lanes wide and headed towards the ocean. And then two cars come up along the side of me. And it was full of black boys. And, and I got about uh, 20 miles to go. <laughs> anyway, they pulled up along the side of me and escorted me. I just kept it going. And when I got to down about Wilmington where I need to turn off, I took an exit and turned off. So now I'm home down by the ocean, about 20 miles from where I started. And I have an apartment in the second story. And across the, there was a field about the size of that between here and the water. There's a railroad track. And on the other side of the railroad track, there's a lumber yard. So I'm sitting here listening to the radio, and, and the fire is burning 20 miles towards me from L.A. And, and guess what I see? I see some guys going through that lumber yard, and pretty soon the lumber yard's on fire. And so what I'm testifying to you, uh, I was in the Watts riot. <coughs> I seen the beginning fire, and I seen that last fire. <coughs> what I seen is civil desert disturbance. People are not happy. People are thinking they don't have their freedoms and don't have these things. And they didn't have them. We've progressed quite a bit to, from that day until now. And we sure don't want to go back. We sure don't want these colored people to have to go back to that point. We sure don't want these Mexican people to go back to that point. And we can make a difference right now by taking care of some of these bureaucracies and do it in a peaceful way. Let me tell, talk to you about the Mexicans. But these are just things I know about the, the, the Negro. I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. When I when I go went, uh, go through Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, <coughs> and I would see these little government houses. And in front of that government house, the, the door was usually open, and the, the, the older people and the kids, and there's always at least a half a dozen people sitting on the porch. They didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for their young girls to do. And because they were the, basically on government subsidy, and so now what do they do? They abort their, their young children, they put their young men in jail because they never they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? They just transferred. Yeah, they didn't get no more freedom. They got less freedom. They had less uh, family uh, alive, and their happiness. You can see in their faces they weren't happy sitting on that concrete, concrete sidewalk. Down there, they were probably growing their turnips. So that's all government. That's not freedom. Now let me talk about the Spanish people. You know, I understand that they come over here against our Constitution and cross our borders. <clears throat> but they're here, and they're people. And I've worked beside beside a, a lot of them. Don't tell me they don't work, and don't tell me they don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me they don't have better family structures than most of us white people. When you see those Mexican families, they're together, they're picnic together, they're spending their time together, and I'll tell you, in my way of thinking, they're awful nice people. 
And we need to have those people join us and be with us, not 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 come to our party. I one thing I've alert about our constitution is our constitution was formed and it set up for the individual. Remember on top of our flags over here, we the people, and the the power is in we the people, the sovereignty is in the, we the people. But even more so, it's in the individual, individual soul. And our our Heavenly Father thinks we're so important. And our con our founding fathers felt we, we, that soul was so important that they formed the whole Constitution so we could have freedom and liberty and be able to conscience, our, our own individual conscience, to do the things I talked about, to be able to create and move about, have free re religion and enjoy life here on earth. I, this is what I have to say here. Thank you very much. Would you want to answer? Any, any questions or anything? <laughs> yeah, I'm from uh, Kansas. And uh, I was watching the news, finding out what was happening here. And uh, I got out of the cattle thing when I turned 21, but my uh, family since 1840s, Rockwall, Texas, uh, has been ranching. Uh, my aunt and uncle south of Albuquerque had 20 exceptions there, and the same thing was happening to them It's happening here, but it didn't go this far. They waited for them to die, and they ended up with it. My cousins didn't want it. I was born on in South Dakota, 32 section ranch, four days South Dakota. And same thing there. My granddad had that one. BLM ended up that whole thing. And so I had a relationship on what's happening here. And I came here, just jumped in the truck, drove out, want to know what's really happening. And I've learned a lot. And I respect you, how you're standing up to this. And Everything I've learned, I'm taking home with me. And hey, let me uh, interrupt you. We're not right hearing here. it in the media. Yeah, let me tell you what's important about what he's saying. You, you hear what he's saying? He's saying that it, the ranch didn't pass down to another generation. He, why didn't it pass down to another generation? They got tired of fighting it. They got tired of fighting it. And when exactly. the old people died, they, they the young people just give up. And so who ends up with it? the United States government, BLM. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The older generation should be teaching the younger generation a better way to do it. And when they, they should be excited. They should have had a grandchild or a son or, or somewhere, a daughter, whatever, down the road that would have been excited about producing for America. Instead of they were discouraged because they seen what grandpa or dad had to go through. And that's part of what's wrong with America. What do you think's wrong with all of our industry? You, you, the young people don't have any, anything to get excited about. They don't have anything to experiment with. You know, half the excitement is a dream. They don't have nothing to dream about. It don't matter what, don't matter how big the dream is. If you don't have a dream, you don't really have much happiness. The dreams. The dream's worth more than the, the, the production. Right. And America seems like they don't have no dream no more. <clears throat> Another question, please. Um, just two things. I read that uh, Representative Steve Stockman wrote a letter to the Obama administration stating exactly what you were talking about, that uh, the federal government's in violation of the Constitution because of all the, uh, all their bureaucracies being armed, one to see um, if you've been in contact with him or him with you, and then also I read in the Salt Lake Tribune as well about the Western legislators meeting up in Utah yesterday about this very thing, that they need to start getting their land back from the federal government and that the state manages it versus the federal government. Okay, what you're talking about is a lot of confusion. The Constitution is not uh, any kind of confusion. There's no doubt that Utah and the state of Nevada is a sovereign state. You don't have to read only just a little bit in the Constitution to understand that we are a sovereign state. That's what our founding fathers uh, 
intended to happen. That's what the Congress did when they made a mistake. So, uh, so why don't we act like we're a state? Now talking about like what Ken Ivory and the people in uh, uh, there's several Western say what is the American uh, Land Council I believe what are they doing and this is what Bundy has to say you cannot ask the President of the United States for your land back you cannot ask Congress for your land back and you can't expect the judicial system to give your land back and why. Some of you ought to know the answer by now. Why? Because they already own it. They don't have it. They don't have it. Who has it? it? We do. Okay, we the people already have it. So why? You can't ask for that back if you already have it. So that's what I'm saying. You can't. You can't ask for something you already have. Am I right? Right. Okay, why are we worrying about uh, getting our land back? Why are we worrying about going to the legislature? Why are we worrying about asking Congress or a representative state about it? Or but uh, they they you can't you, they can ask all they want and they can't give you something you already have. Very simple. You only have to, like I said you only have to read a few words of the Constitution to figure that one out. Another question. One right here, please. I was speaking with Ammon earlier today. He talked loud so everybody. Uh, th there's this question about 20 years ago and, and previous to that, the BLM or offered to buy people's rights to their land, and a lot of people sold that. Now Ammon can correct me. I think it was the BLM that actually bought the rights for some of these ranchers, or the state bought it on behalf of the BLM. Could you talk about previous ranchers? Uh, I, I can talk about that and try to clear that up. What he's saying is my fellow ranchers, which I had 52 uh, of them here in Clark County, there was a time when they, the administrative regulation uh, had just about drove them all out of business. We'd been to the courts, and the, and the courts actually ruled on our side. What the, the deal in the court was, <coughs> there's, a, a, there's a cow affect the tortoise. And the court decision, there was no scientific evidence that the cow had any uh, bad effect on the tortoise. So we walked out of the courtroom. After spending about a hundred thousand dollars there, a few ranchers to walk out of the courtroom with a victory. When we're on the steps of the court, the uh, uh, Sahara Club lawyer uh, steps up alongside and remember the, the decision. There's no uh, scientific proof that the, there are any uh, bad effects uh, between the tortoise and the cow. And the lawyer steps up along the side of us and he says, maybe. Now remember, we just got through the, having a full force and effect saying we couldn't run cows here because of the tortoise. Now the judge has said there's no scientific evidence that, that, that there's any conflict. But the environmental lawyer said maybe. They may be effect. And so now what happens? Another, within about 10 days, all these ranchers get another full force and effect decision say remove your livestock because they may be effect of the tortoise may be effect of the hab on the habitat. So that then you can't go to their courts and win. So that, at that point, a lot of my rancher friends bailed out because they couldn't see no win. And what, they was I think six out of the 52 that got some payment. Part of that payment was from Clark County. Part of that payment come from uh, Nature Conservancy. Nature Conservancy. And I don't know how that trans land transfers went. They were buying rights. Remember those preemptive rights that have been created by two beneficial use? That's what the government wanted, is those rights, those water rights, those grazing rights, access rights. So that actually would be proof that if they were willing to buy those rights, then you're standing on your rights because you didn't sell out. Yeah, and that, that proves that, that rights were really worth something, and rights were worth enough money or worth something enough the government actually bought right. Thank you.
Thank you. Another question. How do we? Mansion family up in Nye County, same situation as grandfather started the ranch. He estimated that uh, just between him and his dad, since the BLM was informed, they spent over three million dollars defending their rights, um, run, trying to run them into the ground. Um, similar situation with you? Well, yeah, they for 20 years they've tried to break me. Because I, they was, uh, I was supposed to be a willing seller, willing buyer, I decided that I wouldn't sell. And then they've tried to break me in the courts. And uh, let me tell you what a lawyer in Las Vegas, law firm in Las Vegas, would, would offer me for help. First, they want a $30,000 down payment. And then the lawyer wants 800 and, 800 and something dollars an hour. And his sisters, they want $500 an hour. Now I have at least seven, BL, uh, seven uh, from the Department of in, uh, Interior, seven lawyers fighting me on paper and in the courts, and they want me to defend myself in the courts. Okay, I'm going to defend myself, but I'll be damned if I'm going to buy a, a $30,000 lawyer. They break me in one day. And so for 20 years I fought my, my, my own case to the, to the Ninth Circuit Court twice. And of course, you know I'm losing every time, but my purpose was not not to worry about that. My purpose was to take state sovereignty to the Supreme Court and take the endangered species to the Supreme Court. And I had that on the way, except people like Ken Ivory and the Federal uh, uh, American Land Council went back me when I get it to the Ninth Court. The state of Nevada went back me, Arizona, Utah, on and on. I needed their backing. I needed the county's backings, and when I couldn't get enough backing, I felt comfortable going forward, and I said, well, hey, I'm not going to give the Ninth Circuit another win. So I back up, and then I'm in this situation here where they figure, okay, we're going to come with force now on the ground and take Bundy out, and that's what was happening here last week. I have a question. If, uh, given the situation that was last Saturday, um, and Harry Reid's uh, comments about this isn't over. Um, what? How? Where else can it go? It, what? What? What's, what could the government do next? Isn't, what's their their only option if it's not over? Seems to be the bridge again. Well, I'm sure they're going to want to throw more paperwork at me, and I already got uh, four certified letters that I have said I'm not going to open until. I'm going to put them in a bag and hold them for a while, and maybe I'll turn them over to my lawyer someday. In other words, they're not going to force me into a move in the court. And you got to remember, what I, I, this, a lot of people misunderstand me. They, they think I'm a, not American. I don't, I don't like the government. I, I honor our government. I honor our Constitution. I honor our statehood. I honor our state laws. But I'll be darned if I'm going to honor a federal court that has no jurisdiction or authority arresting power, our policing power, over we the people, and over this land, another, this property. They're not the owners. Who owns this land? We people. do. People. Of what, what, what county? Clark, Clark County. County. That's right. Sheriff, am I right? Come on, come in here. Yes, sir. I want, uh, this sheriff uh, has no jurisdiction and authority here. Is that right? Come out here to show support and and, uh, let, and affirm with the other people that are here that uh, the, really the Fed shouldn't be involved in it. You can share. That's right. Now let me tell you, if, if I was in your county, I want to tell you how powerful you are. If I was in his county, he has constitutional jurisdiction, authority, rest, and policing power, and resting power, and he has authority to put the handcuffs on you. If we was in his county, here he don't have no authority. What county are you from, Charles? From Elkhart County, Indiana. Okay, he traveled out here to. All right. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now I want to yeah, uh, want to impress this on your mind. In his county, he has more of that authority we just talked about than the president of the United States. Did you know the President of the United States could come in his county and couldn't put handcuffs on anybody? And neither could the President's army. Because, because 
the president and his, their army don't represent we the people of that county. This man here has been elected and paid to protect our life, liberty, and property. Is that right? <laughs> and very simple, very simple form of government. It's constitutional. Why is it constitutional? That's what our constitution laid out for us. You know, sometimes that's, we protect you from criminals, but sometimes we have to step in and protect you from government. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Here we go. I haven't had that. Oh, before. my goodness. <laughs> I thought I was, was going to fall over. That's what they should do. Anyway, talk to these people a minute. And, uh, uh, that's, what I, that's what I did in 2011. I the Food and, Drug, Food, Food and Drug Administration came into my county and was harassing an Amish milk farmer for distributing raw milk, uh, not against state statute, I might add. And uh, the Department of Justice, the Food and Drug Administration was trying to come in, and I said, uh, you know, I'm from the government. I have to abide by the Fourth Amendment, and so do you. And I told him to get out. Don't come back to this farmer's property, or I'll arrest you for trespass. And you come back <laughs> yeah. yeah! I hear you. Hear that, Gillespie? Yeah. Tell them uh, who you represent in your position. Well, I, I represent the people. You know, it's the, the sheriff is the highest elected law enforcement officer in the nation. Yeah. Everybody else is appointed. And there's a reason for that. Because we have a name, we have a face, we have uh, you have a number for the sheriff. Who, who do you contact with the feds? There, there's no number. There's no face to them. You know, they they come in and, and and even if and I'm not here to judge Mr. Bundy, but even if he was wrong. 200 armed federal agents to, to gather up cows and uh, to do this. It should be the sheriff intervening uh, so that we don't have a Waco or Ruby Ridge situation yeah. all over again. And quite frankly, uh, you even said that if the sheriff came, you'd you'd talk to him or submit to him yeah, or whatever. Sure. Uh, everybody asks if, if uh, they was to arrest you for any of the actions we had or for the, uh, the fee, if I owe, uh, if they come and arrest, would I resist? And I said I wouldn't resist my county sheriff, but I darn sure would resist the federal government. Yeah. So let's get the sheriff involved. I'm not here to tell the sheriff what to do. But I was here last Saturday. Involved in this kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. Come on. If you got another question for the sheriff, he came a long way to talk to you people. I hope you sheriff, listen that. to him. How could this sheriff have done it better? Well, he could, as soon as he, he realized that there was an issue. Uh, and hopefully he would ask the feds to report to him uh, as they're doing things. And, uh, you know, they really shouldn't be doing things in a vacuum. Uh, he should know about it. And uh, the sheriff could, could step up and say, okay, there may be some issue here. Uh, and, again, I'm not standing in judgment of Mr. Bundy, but if, if the sheriff says there could be some issue, let's look into it. Fine, let's look into it. But typically a sheriff doesn't bring in a bunch of, uh, you know, an army of guns and, and things like that to resolve things. I, he I rolls down, knocks on the door, and says, can we sit down day. and talk? Yeah, my deputies and I arrest people every day. Uh, sometimes they're, they're felony warrants, and we don't use a SWAT team on everything and, and, and things like that. It's just, it's just something that, you know, here, here you have a peaceful man, and, uh, you know, he, he thinks he's doing right in what he's doing. Uh, somebody else may think differently, but let the sheriff get involved in and in intervene in this situation. We don't need an unnamed, unfaced federal government doing it. Amen. Oh, you must have been on the wrong side of the freeway. <laughs> no, I was taking that uh, Any other questions? Yeah. You, you have the right to deputize everybody in your county, right? I do. I can call the county to aid. Yeah. So we so we wouldn't be domestic terrorists in your. Uh, oh county. no. And I haven't seen any domestic terrorists here. In fact, I I don't associate with domestic terrorists. And I don't see any domestic <laughs> terrorists here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 off last week. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it, it's one of the things that uh, we we uh, uh, we want a peaceful resolution to this, obviously. Uh, and again, I'm not standing in judgment of anybody, uh, but it, it, it's really, there's a better way to do that. And uh, so that we don't have bloodshed, so we don't have issues like property being destroyed, uh, his unnecessarily so. Uh, I understand we just found some, some cattle in, in, a, in a grave and, and things like that, and this is just unnecessary. Uh, and, and I dare say if the sheriff would be involved, uh, that probably wouldn't happen. If, uh, let me... Uh, uh, I don't want to step on the sheriff's toes, but I want to say that 
this is a constitutional issue. And so I, the sheriff needs to decide if he's, he's, decide, if he's uh, working for we the people. Yeah. And he is working. We've elected him and we're paying him, so he's working for we the people. So don't you think that the sheriff should stop and think, well, uh, is this a sovereign state? Okay, if this is a sovereign state, isn't this land we're standing on must belong to the state of Nevada? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm elected by we the people of Clark County to protect their life, liberty, and property, isn't this property? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so why would the, why would the dear sheriff just not sit negotiating with the BLM? Why don't he just say no? Okay. That, that's what I've said about to the governor and the state uh, uh, county sheriff. You know, you can solve this by just saying no. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in my experience, and the sheriff, the sheriff is a good example here. What did you say? You said no. Said no, don't come back without a warrant. Yeah, you said no. That's all you had to say. And I never seen any any government ever run over one of these these no's. One of these days they're going to do that, and uh, it is going to be sad. So I don't know whether my sheriff said no or not. That's all I've asked him to do for the last two years or, or longer. Just say no. But when he didn't say no, then then he's basically uh, aiding and betting the enemy. Exactly. Now I could be wrong in my thinking, but I'm not. I'm not. Will not uh, allow anybody to say those founding fathers were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff Rogers, Our have you? Sheriff of Clark County is just a lackey to hear him. It's a gutless wonder because I saw him on the stage with you last week, and you said you gave him one hour to take down those barricades and let your cattle go. That sheriff turned around, turned his back on you, just stared down the ground. He didn't know what to do. Okay, but let me correct you. I didn't have to say nothing about those cattle. He didn't. I didn't say nothing about those cattle. I said, I said, disarm those agents and bring the guns and put them in front of the flag. It was nothing said about the cattle. No, it wasn't. We were the ones that chose. I see. Yes, uh, Sheriff, uh, your association with Oath Keepers, there's been a lot of controversy about that. Can you clarify to the public what Oath Keepers is about and what your association is with it? Well, I'm a member of Oath Keepers, uh, and the, the issue with Oath Keepers that stems primarily out of Hurricane Katrina and the debacle of the Hurricane uh, Katrina gun grab, and, and that is uh, law enforcement and military weren't prepared to uh, basically say no to the federal government when they came in and said, let's do something unconstitutional, like like a gun grab. So uh, it, it Oath Keepers came out of that, and uh, basically it's, it's a, uh, a bunch of peace-loving patriots like yourselves that are, are looking to um, have constitutional government and to um, not abide by any orders that are unconstitutional like uh, hurting people in the concentration camps or disarming the public or whatever the, whatever the case may be. So it's uh, that, that's all part of what we're uh, trying to accomplish. And uh, this goes right along with this, uh, with this, this issue. And it's not, you know, with, I think, with Mr. Bundy, you know, it's, I, you know, a lot of people are arguing out there that, ah, eh, there's federal case law, there's, you know, two federal court orders, there's this and that. But again, it, it can all be resolved yes. if the sheriff would just get involved. That's, that's what I'm saying. Have you spoken to Sheriff Gillespie since you've been here? Do you intend to? Uh, I, you know, if if he's not going to respond to even his own citizens, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm not here to tell the sheriff what to do. I, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just telling you, if I was sheriff, that When's your term run out over there where you are? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no intention of moving to Nevada. So, so you don't have any... <laughs> so, well, we got elections so, coming up in November. For uh, as, a, as an American, then, you don't have any questions for Sheriff Gillespie and and, and how he how he operates that, that system? Well, I, you know, I guess uh, my yeah. question is I've already asked. You know, why, why, why aren't you here intervening? You know, I mean, it, it, it could be a peaceful intervention. Uh, I'd sit down here with Mr. Bundy at the kitchen table and talk to him about it and uh, that's what I did with the, the milk farmer and that's what I do with other people that, that have issues and, and uh, let's resolve it uh, that's you know you take an oath of office not to not to write speeding tickets and keep a jail and arrest bad guys but to uphold the Constitution that's what it's all about
Uh, let me uh, uh, bring you up on a little current event with the sheriff just, just, just a few hours ago. I, was, I wasn't dealing with his, the sheriff, but I was dealing with his uh, sergeant in, in command or, uh, over this area. Uh, Empey, Sheriff Empey in Wampa Valley. We we had this uh, mass grave of cattle up here, and uh, I don't know, my boys or whatever had equipment there, and they wanted to uh, excavate that. And I said, no, you don't excavate that. That's the sheriff's uh, evidence. And if you're going to do any excavating, the sheriff should have somebody there to see his evidence. And, and of course, what I did is I called and asked for a Assistance and permission to excavate if we're going to deal with the sheriff's heaven. Guess what he said? He said, uh, he said, uh, it's just a matter of opinion. And and we, we don't have, uh, you know, if that's not evidence to us, there was no criminal, uh, we, uh, there was no criminal act here, so we don't have no act or responsibility to keep uh, evidence. How did you know there's no criminal act? You well, know, we, we, we <laughs> good, good point. Good point. Good point. Yeah. It was just a matter of opinion whether it was a criminal thing, and we said, well, you know, the court order said they can seize and impound. They never said they could destroy or abuse or bury or any of that. Well, that's just a matter of opinion. And so, let me take it just a little bit further. So I did call my local brand inspector, and uh, he was in Las Vegas eating dinner, I guess, or something. He said it couldn't be here in the afternoon. He did, the local brand inspector said, uh, I said, I need an inspection on those cattle that's in the pit if we dig it open. And he said he would come this afternoon. So if he shows up, we'll let the Nevada State brand inspector inspect these cattle, and that will be about as official as we get. Can we be there as witnesses as well? I don't know. Uh, 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 excuse me. Here is some evidence for you to get share with the media. We climbed in the pit and took pictures for you. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Uh, Ammon, have you got a report on what's happened up there? No, they were on. They were. They are turn, unbearing. Tell me, tell me where you can turn towards the people. They are uh, unbearing the. Uh, and so far, they've found four. They got a long ways to go. So, and that was a couple hours ago. Ryan, let me know that. So. There's still more in there, but uh, they, they know four for sure. Are they saving the bones from the park? I just want to thank you, Sheriff, for setting a good example. And my question was, what percentage of your state does the federal government manage for you? Uh -huh. uh, certainly not like Nevada. Like, uh, it's, uh, you know, out east, you have a lot, lot less of uh, federal involvement because they were more of the original state, but uh, as you go further west, it's a nightmare. I realize that. I empathize with you. Thank you. Deb, I had an analogy. You talked about... I, I, had a, I shared it with a couple of you about the sheriff since he's here, but I grew up on a farm, and maybe you guys have too, and if you've ever been around chickens, well, a mother hen might have 10 or 12 chickens, the chicks, and those chicks will follow that, that hen around, and if anything interrupts with those chi chicks, that hen will do everything that she can to, to send that uh, to defend their chicks. And I've seen hens, one hen uh, uh, run off of a, a German shepherd before, or even things that bigger. And that's the way a sheriff should be with his people. And you know, I've even, as a young boy, I've even messed with those chicks, and, and I'm the I'm the, I was the farmer's son. I had every right, right? We own those chicks. But that chick didn't care, or that chicken didn't care. That mother hen didn't care. That mother hen still jumped on us and chased us off just like anything else. Made sure those chicks were protected, and that's the way a sheriff should be. Also, I don't, some of you may have seen this before, but there's the pictures, and it was really touching to me, where this grass fire went through this prairie, and they were going through, and they were seeing these pheasants, uh, hens, and they were completely charred, and they may pull those hens off, and those baby chicks run out they there alive. And that's the way our sheriff should be. He shouldn't be standing around watching us get beat down on the side of the street. He should be doing everything he can to protect his chicks. And that's the that's what a good sheriff does. And I just Amen. want to draw that in there. Yeah. The, the sheriff doesn't want to do his job, and he's lying to us. 
and evidently is in Reed's back pocket. What can we do as we the people to get rid of both of them? Yeah. Well, yeah. you can elect them, but right now we the people need to uh, do what you're doing and uh, stand your ground as, as, as individuals. I mean, uh, one of the scariest, uh, I think, moment of this whole thing, if I had any fear, uh, and I felt really strong in it, but if I had any fear, is when I pull out of my home and I come up to here and all of this, uh, all these uh, F BLM law enforcement is along us, they're just sort of, and you're thinking they're going to stop me any moment. And the fear is, is I couldn't call 911 and, and have any uh, any relief. I couldn't call uh, 691 and get any relief out of the city of Mesquite. I, I, was, I was on my own without any backing. It wasn't until the militia come. And that, uh, this same feeling I had was the day the militia come. I went to Vegas and actually talked to my uh, sheriff and did some other business. When I come home, those white cars and, and the trucks with those uh, armed guards were gone. The camp over here was gone. And I could see cattle right out of this meadow, and they were still here. And, uh, you know, the difference between having some militia here, or it would have been the same if I'd had my county sheriff here, mm -hmm. and not having, it was it was totally unbelievable mm -hmm. when I actually could see I had some freedom and protection. That's the difference between, uh, a, 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 I guess, a communist-type government and a free republic type of government. Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, on our open range down there in Cane Springs and Grapevine, they was the same way cut our herd down to the wild burrow. Oh, the 53 years, I have yet to see a wild burrow in our range area. And then they started hauling tr tortoises. We never had a tortoise in that area. They started hauling them in and setting them off. And we'd see tracks out in the desert, and there'd be a tortoise. And you pick it up, they don't suck its head in. It's been the handle quite a bit. Well, anyway, uh, any other questions? There's a, uh, lady that would like to speak. She's an active police officer, and uh, she wanted to say something, Dad. Well, speak loud and speak to us. How's that? I'm a woman. I speak loud. I am a badge-carrying, card-carrying oath keeper, and I'm an uh, active peace officer. And I really am sending the call out to fellow peace officers to join us and come here and, and Mr. Rogers in uniform. And we are peace officers, not police officers. We keep the peace. We're here to keep the peace and to give him his constitutional rights. And I'd take a bullet for this man because I'm telling you right now, he's officially my Uncle Bundy. <laughs> you know? yeah. But, yeah. I have a question to that. Do we need a, pe uh, a peacemaker or do we need a sheriff that has constitutional jurisdiction and authority? My uh, county, uh, Gillespie, offered to be a peacemaker, <laughs> but I didn't get the job that Gillespie offered to stand along the, in, uh, with his deputy along the road and, uh, you know, keep peace. But what does peace do? That allows them to go steal my cattle. That was the same thing they were doing with all those guns, is keeping peace. I'm trying to be politically correct. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not happy. Well, okay. It was a big start, but you needed, needed to go further. But, but listen, what I told, listen what I told Sheriff Gillespie. You know, I don't need you to be a peacemaker. You're going to have to make your decision whether you're on my side or their side. Mm -hmm. We don't need somebody in the middle. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said about our Constitution, mm -hmm. about our statehood, about who owns this land? You either make the decision you're on their side or on my side. You know what decision he made? He made the decision to go get under his table and stay there. He pulled all of his people back because he wasn't willing to make he, But I actually said, you can't come out there and uh, be a peacemaker. That's not, that's not your job. You got, you've got to make, be on one side or the other. If they keep the road, they wouldn't be able to keep the That is correct. That is correct. And Mr. Bundy, if she's trying to make the point of the difference between a 
peace officer and a law enforcement officer. Law enforcement is of the government. The revenue generator. A peace officer is of the people. That's the point I think that she was trying to make there. Okay, let me uh, say something else there. What have I called for? What are we the people called for? We said disarm uh, the bureaucracy, the bureaucrats. That's what we called for. Now, let me go a little further on that. Those bureaucrats should be the peace officers. There should be the good boy scout that's out there helping and uh, uh, doing their duty, uh, being a good citizen, helping people, assisting people, teaching people, uh, whatever, all of the things they could do as a Boy Scout. Does. What, what does Boy Scout do? Who's the Boy Scout here? Yes? What is Boy Scout supposed to do? Be prepared. Be prepared for what? Anything. Anything? <laughs> I might ask the wrong person. Do a good turn daily. Do a good turn daily. There we go. Yeah. That's what a Boy Scout should be. What, don't you think BLM and Forest Service and Park Service and and uh, Peace and Wild Oaks, don't you think they should be out there doing a good de deed daily for we the people? Amen. Oh, because that's what they should be doing. And the, do, you, do they have to have a gun on their hip and an army behind them to do a good deed? No. Mm -mm. They should be helping us produce, helping us be saved, helping rescue us. Not, not, not putting guns at us. I don't think that's what we pay them their, their wages for and, and we retire them. And, and pay their medical and all these things. Is that what we're doing it for? Aren't they supposed to be a good deed daily? Wouldn't that be better than being uh, acting like the sheriff? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I might be all crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, anyway. Sheriff. Sure. Sure. Um, are there any other members from the CSPOA that attend on supporting or speaking out? Yeah, there'll be sheriffs here all week. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow, and then there'll be some more sheriffs coming in. Awesome. Okay. And Mr. Yeah. everything that's happened in, well, excuse me, not seen Everything that's happened is taking steps back in whatever the original plan was. Us being here for support is tremendous. But what else can we do to help you get back to the original work you did? To help you, you know, start running your life again? Well, you know, there's a lot of lot of concern about that. And yes, they, and I've got my cattle back to, you know, a certain extent. We've got, you know, problems with the cattle. We've got, like, cows and cows that are not tired up and we're still working on them. In other words, we got, a, I don't know how many. We had originally 27 doggy cows, and we put some of them back together, but not very many. We've got cattle out here that, you know, basically when they turn them under the, uh, under the, down under the freeway, turn them loose, there was, uh, my, my count on the videos was 350, uh, 352 head, I believe. Yeah, 352 head of cattle coming in. Kept counting cows, calves, and everything. And we only got to, went to the farm, which was the whole place down there with 50 cattle. So there's 300 cattle somewhere here that we haven't took care of, and we haven't got them home. We haven't we haven't been able to ranch them. They're just you know, they got loose and they're in the brush and up towards the mountain and they're back on their natural habitat. But they're I they're not where I can take care of them and get my calves and all that. But then there's some range improvements that are they're definitely tore out. And they're but our cattle are let's just put it this way: the cattle are okay. They're going to survive and everything's going to be as, as good as we can make it. But what we can do is, and this is what I've said, we can start putting a little pressure on our county sheriffs to take care of these criminals. You know, th this is something that I can't seem to get the media to understand. And I, and and you that were there, raise your hand. Who was there? Who was there? Okay, you've seen what happened. You people back to the these guns away, and what did they do? You give them a little time to run, and they did run, didn't they? Mm -hmm. But you know what they did? They run right past, their, their county sheriff was present there, they run right past their county sheriffs, whether Glesby there or his deficit, they run right past, and they, they provided a, a, 
access across the southbound lane of mm -hmm. Interstate 15, send them up to north north lane of uh, I-15 without taking their guns away, without arresting them. And there was probably approximately 100 cars, and they went into the city of Mesquite, and the city of Mesquite police didn't do nothing with them. They was all armed. They've been there every couple of three weeks, I know, all, uh, armed and all of this type of thing. city of Mesquite never did nothing. They weren't, went into Arizona. Arizona didn't do nothing. They went into Utah. Nothing ever did. Nobody did anything. And now those people are scattered out where it's out across the United States, still carrying their guns. And the media never even reported. Nobody reported. Nobody reported me. Nobody reported to you where they went. Monday, I was up on that bridge Saturday, and when those guys left, the lady said she counted 104 vehicles came out of that ravine. Okay, and I'm saying and approximately 100. I don't know. I'm telling you, most of them have out-of-state licenses. They came from Washington, Oregon, mm -hmm. California, Arizona, and Utah. So they go, those people go with personal vehicles. Was they armed? I got plate numbers. Sure, there's one there. I got plate numbers. And and those people are out in those people are out in with the citizens now, and with the established bureaucrats, bureaucrats across the United States, and nobody's even questioned them. Now I'll ask the sheriff this question: If I robbed a convenience store, say here in Bunkerville, and I took Mouth North at 515. Mm -hmm. I went through the city of Mesquite. I went through the state of Arizona. I went through the border, uh, 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 the entry border, what they call it? Bo uh, border, entry. border of entry. And I went into the, across the Washington County, Iron County, Beaver County, and on across the end of the United States. And I did, all I did was I robbed a convenience store. What would have happened to me? Well, we'd pretty much chase you down. Sure you'd chase me down. What would you do to me? Oh, that's right. Sure you'd arrest me. Then what would you do to me? Take your guns from me. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And what, what's incarceration mean? Jail. Okay, you'd be put in jail. That, 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 that little guy that robbed the convenience store, that's what you do, wouldn't you? So why did somebody do that to these 200 people plus a hundred and what? How many cars? He said 104. 104 cars. Both that's of these cowardice. People. Why didn't they do something? Why didn't the media at least report where they went? That's the thing I don't understand about America. I just can't understand that about us people. Michael said it's just one radio show, the government media complex. And I have all their gonads. And, and I'm, I'm here just hollering and raving, throwing a fit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, what a good meeting. Uh, I hope you people get some good out of it, and, and if there's something else that we need that. Sheriff, what county are you from? Elkhart, E-L-K-H-A-R-T, County Sheriff uh, in Indiana. What else can we do to help Mr. Bundy, <laughs> Sheriff? Well, um, you know, my concern is, is, uh, is uh, de-escalating this, you know, in, in a sense, uh, both sides. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we can't set up camp here forever. Mr. Bundy's probably going to get tired of <laughs> you know, the constant traffic eventually. Uh, I mean, uh, everybody's been gracious and, and uh, uh, respectful and so on, and the Bundys have been great hosts. But, um, uh, again, I think that's where the, the sheriff needs to get involved, to kind of intervene in, in this situation and, and uh, help it be resolved peacefully. In your county, if a senator spoke in escalation tactics the way that he did, would you... Uh well, you have How do you to the source it? there. Uh, <laughs> Senator Reid is, is out of line. And, and excuse, excuse me just a minute. The source is our uh, majority leader in the Senate of the United States. So he, he isn't just somebody. He is the majority leader of the Senate of the United States. I, but, but it's we the people that can take care of that. And, you know, it's through election process or however uh, the law has has allowed, how our Constitution has allowed. Uh, I, I just think that uh, he's out of line, and again, domestic terrorists, I don't see it. At, at what point is, when he's escalating things of that nature, and he is the United States, can another county take jurisdiction on a senator making those kind of threats since he is the United States? I don't know. Hmm, okay. Do you know what? 
I myself, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm here every day until Clive comes to me and tells me get the hell out of here. Yeah, me too. I'm behind you. Hundred percent. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Okay, good. 